Dear people watching and listening, Assalamu alaikum. Kindly like and share this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please support my channel by contributing to my Patreon account so that I can continue making the audiobook series. Salahuddin al Ayyubi, Volume 2 the establishment of the Ayyubid state. Start of part two of chapter six. Volunteers in the Ayyubid army. In addition to the regular fighters, both cavalry and infantry, who were registered in the department of the Ayyubid army and the feudal troops belonging to the Ayyubid emirs, and other emirs who came under the authority of Salahuddin one after another, who supplied the Ayyubid army with fighters at times of need, and in addition to the Sultan's Mamluks, there were also individuals who volunteered to put themselves at the army's disposal, out of love for jihad for the sake of Allah, and a desire to liberate Muslim lands from crusader occupation. In fact, the era of Islamic revival began to show clearly with the emergence of Mujahid Imad al-Din Zangi, the founder of the Zangid state, and at the time of his son Nuruddin Mahmud al-Shahid. This era reached its peak at the time of Salah al-Din. His era brought to mind the days of volunteerism and jihad in the early days of Islam. It comes as no surprise to discover that the army of Salah al-Din included a large number of volunteers, especially at the Battle of Hattin and the conquest of Jerusalem and subsequent battles, which has attracted the attention of historians. Ibn Kathir states that when the Sultan decided to conquer Jerusalem, scholars and righteous people came to him as volunteers. The volunteers came from various Muslim social backgrounds, tribesmen, villagers and city dwellers, poor and rich alike, especially scholars of jurisprudence and Sufis. Nuruddin Mahmud ordered that the call should go out to the warriors and Mujahideen, and new volunteers including the young men of the cities and strangers, to make ready and prepare to confront the Franks, the polytheists and heresy. The word volunteer was used to describe those groups who were not part of the regular forces. In the mosques, the sermon givers urged the people to volunteer for the Muslim army. No sooner had the sermon givers come down from the pulpits than the worshippers were shouting slogans and invocations, coming in groups and individually from all directions to the army camp. Salah Hattin sometimes delegated to the volunteers the task of executing prisoners, especially heretics or crusader archers, as happened at Bayt al Ahsan in 575 Hijri, that is 1179 Common Era. Following the victory of Hattin, Salah Hattin asked each one of the volunteers, including the Sufis, to execute one of the prisoners belonging to the two crusader groups, the Templars and Hospitallers. The volunteers had accomplished great things on the day of Hattin and contributed to the achievement of a swift victory against the crusaders when they hastened to set fire to the dry grass that surrounded the crusaders. The flames leapt high and the fire grew hot and the wind was against the crusaders, so it blew the heat and smoke towards them, and they were faced with a combination of thirst, hot seasonal weather, the heat and smoke of the fire, and the heat of battle, according to Ibn al Azir. Auxiliary Squadrons in the Army The Engineer Corps the army was usually accompanied by an engineer corps and a medical corps. The former undertook missions which required specialized knowledge of the military engineering that was required for fighting, especially attacks on walls and ditches, 
such as setting up heavy war machines like the Mangonel, Testudo, heavy catapults, Nafta Troa, and so on. They also built camps and walls, especially in places that had a sensitive military advantage. Built and demolished bridges, filled in ditches, dug wells, decided where to lay siege to the walls of a city intended for conquest, and where to breach its walls, diverted the course of rivers, and did other engineering tasks which made up the duties of this corps. During the siege of Jerusalem, Salahuddin and his army kept circling the city for five days, and finally those who had knowledge of engineering found a suitable place in the northern side of the wall, near the twin pillared gate and the church of Zion, and Salahuddin ordered that the siege engines be set up in that place. In 581 Hijri, that is 1185 Common Era, during the siege of Mosul, when the army of Salahuddin was unable to achieve a direct military victory against it, despite his many attempts because of the strength of its walls, some of his men suggested depriving the city of water by diverting the flow of the Tigris. He put this idea to the scholar of jurisprudence, Fakhraddin ibn Attahan al-Baghdadi, who was the best engineer of his era, who said, This is possible and not impossible. It is easy and not difficult. In a letter sent by Salahuddin to the Abbasid Caliph, written by his consultant, Al-Qadi al-Fadil, it says, The engineers who have experienced said, that it would be easy to divert the Tigris away from Mosul, and thus deprive that city of a source of water, at which point its people would be forced to hand it over without fighting, and without the harm that would be caused by intensifying the siege. Salahuddin did not put this idea into practice, however, and that was perhaps due to the fact that it was difficult and costly he did not have much time, and he was interested in more important projects. The Medical Corps The Medical Corps accompanied the army to the battlefield in order to treat the sick and wounded, which was necessary. The doctors and their aides formed what might be described as a mobile clinic, with everything that they needed of medicines equipment and stretchers to carry the wounded and sick. This equipment was carried on the backs of animals. They would set up in the camp a tent, where those who needed to could stay overnight. It seems that Salah Haddin's era was one in which matters to do with medicine flourished, because there was a great need for that. Salah Haddin and his emirs spent generously on them. In fact, Salah Haddin started to take an interest in medical matters and encouraged those involved in them from early on in his career. He showed a great interest in the doctors who served the Fatimid court in Egypt and the court of the Atabek Nuruddin in Syria and paid a great deal of attention to them. One of the doctors who took part in the military expeditions Carried out by the Ayyubid army was Abu Zakaria Amin al Tawla, Yahya ibn Ismail al Andalusi, one of the students of Al Hakim Muatzabaddin. He accompanied the army of Salahuddin in battle and then settled in Damascus, like many of the doctors of his era. It seems to us that the reason why they settled in this city was the presence of the great Nuri hospital. Damascus was also chosen because of its proximity to the battlefields, so the wounded and sick could easily be sent there. Abu Zakaria was unable to work at the end of his life, but the Sultan allocated to him a military pension that he received until his death. Salahuddin did the same for other doctors, such as Ibn At-Tahan al-Baghdadi and the oculist Abul Fadl Suleiman al-Masri. One of the most famous doctors of Salah Haddin's corps was Muwaffaq Haddin Abu Nasr Asad, who was known as Ibn al-Matran at Dimashqi. 
It is known that he participated in the Sultan's campaigns and worked in the Nuri Hospital. He wrote a number of medical books, including one titled The Nasiri Paper on the Preservation of Health, and many others. Al-Isfahani said concerning this doctor that he was brilliant and gentle and was greatly praised for his sincerity. He, that is Abu Nasr, earned the appreciation of Salah Din, who held him in high esteem. He was very knowledgeable, smart, and intuitive. The Sultan also had his own private physician, who accompanied him on campaigns because he sometimes suffered from pain and felt unwell, and pustules appeared on his back. His companions criticized him for not taking care of his health and not getting enough rest. His response to them was, When I ride for jihad, the pain disappears until I dismount. His private physician not only treated the Sultan, he also treated his senior Amirs and army commanders. When the ruler of Erbil, Zainuddin Yusuf Niyal Tajin, fell sick with the fever, that would lead to his death during the siege of Acre in 586 Hijri, that is 1190 Common Era. Salahuddin's doctor went to treat him. The Sultan himself would sometimes supervise the treatment of the wounded, as it happened after the Muslims' defeat at the Battle of Arsuk in Shaban in 587 Hijri, that is September 1191 Common Era when he sat and watched as the wounded were brought in and treated. Military Music Corps After the Jawish called out to the camp to get ready, the banners would be unfurled and the cymbals would start to clash. This was akin to military music or marches nowadays and was part of what was done to stir up the zeal of the fighters. Historical events prove that military music played an important role in the Ayyubid army. A special place was allocated for it, which was called the Tabalkhana, which means place of drums. With regard to this, Al-Makrizi wrote that after Salah Haddin settled in Egypt at the end of the Fatimid state, he organized the Tabalkhana. al Qalqashandi explained the meaning of this word, saying, the meaning is house of drums, for it contains drums, flutes and other instruments. These instruments were played at the time of fighting and on other days three times a day. The one who beat the drum was called Dabandar and the one who played the flute was called Munafir. The one who struck the copper cymbals against one another was called the Kusi from Kusat meaning cymbals. The custom was for the symbols to be played when an important military personage arrived at the camp, whilst flags and banners were unfurled and flutes were also played. Every occasion had its own rhythm, which the musicians were taught to play and the fighters were trained to recognize. There was a special rhythm when circumstances dictating that fighting should not stop despite the defeat that had befallen them so the cymbals kept playing and did not stop. There was a special rhythm that announced glad tidings of victory. When news came in Shawwal 587 Hijri, that is 1191 Common Era, that the Muslim fleet had captured Frankish ships that were carrying more than 500 crusaders, the Muslims rejoiced thereat. The victory rhythm was beat and the victory tune was played. Flag Bearers In the army there was a group whose mission was to carry and protect the Sultan's banner. The flag or banner was the symbol which differentiated one group from another and one state from another. Each Muslim and non-Muslim state had its own flag with a particular color. The color of Salah Haddin's flag was yellow. In the middle there was the image of an eagle as a symbol of strength and confidence of victory. Among the banners was a huge banner of yellow silk called Al-Isabah, 
on which were embroidered in gold the titles and names of the sultan a large banner called al jalish at the top of which was a braid of hair and a small yellow flag called a sanajik the large banner was usually carried with the sultan's entourage ali mad al isfahani spoke of salahuddin's banner when the ayyub dami conquered sidon in 583 hijri 1187 common era the envoys of its ruler brought its keys and we ended its dark days and the yellow banner appeared on its walls salahuddin's banner is also mentioned in a number of odes composed by the poets of that era on various occasions when the ayyubid army achieved victory over the crusaders and raised the ayyubid flag over them when the muslims defeated them and destroyed battle ahzan in 575 hijri that is 1179 common era a group of poets offered their congratulations on this occasion among whom was bahaddin abul hasan ali asadi al khurasani who mentioned the yellow banner in his ode al alam ashatani praised it in his ode too which begins with the words i see victory accompanying your yellow banner so march and take over the whole world for you deserve that the flag was a symbol of sovereignty and it was raised in places such as fortresses ships and major military installations when one party was defeated the first thing the victor did was to pull down the banner of the defeated party and raise his banner in its place as the muslims did in the fortresses they conquered which had been in the hands of the crusaders as for the crusader flag it was described by ibn shaddad who saw it being carried on a cart he noted the enemy's flag is raised on a cart to which it is fixed and which is pulled by mules and they fight to defend the flag it is very high like a minaret made of white cloth and painted with red in the shape of a cross in other words the crusader flag was similar to the flag of the international red cross nowadays mail and intelligence organization of the mail organization of the mail system was done by a department that was set up for this purpose which was called diwan al barid and was supervised by state employees whose job was to run the affairs of this institution the ayubid mail and intelligence systems were famous for always being superior to what the crusaders had during the battle of ramla which took place in 573 hijri that is 1177 common era in southern palestine and which ended in defeat for the ayubid army subsequent events proved that salahuddin had a very effective mail service the way in which it was able to move quickly put an end to the rumors which were spreading in egypt which said that salahuddin had been killed the swiftness of the mail put an end to the ambitions of men who had started preparing to topple the ayubid rulers in egypt that was when salahuddin sent his envoys from the egyptian border on dromedaries to cairo to confirm to anyone who may be thinking of rebelling against him that he was still alive and carrier pigeons were sent with the good news that he was on his way back to cairo in 578 hijri that is 1182 common era when salahuddin was in egypt he carried out a raid on kirak and laid siege to it for 10 days when he saw how low his army's provisions were though he ordered them to leave and go back to egypt the ayubid historian muhammad ibn taqiyuddin umar who was with the sultan's entourage said whilst we were marching the mail carriers came to him with the good news of his uncle itaddin farakhshah's victory in the battle of taburia Salahuddin's intelligence system was so accurate and swift that news of the enemy arrived continually hour after hour until morning 
especially during the Siege of Acre. His intelligence network included some of the crusaders to whom the Sultan had granted security on various occasions. The importance of these people was based on the fact that they knew the language of the enemy, and no one would think that they were Salah ad Din's men because of their physical appearance. They supplied the Ayyubid army with news of the enemy, which it would be difficult to get via his Muslim intelligence agents. On one occasion, they told Salah ad Din what the enemy was intending to do, which was to take the Muslim troops unawares at night. They told him about the huge crusader Mangonel on which they had spent 1,500 dinars and which had been prepared to launch an attack on Acre. They also supplied Salah Haddin with news of the German campaign. During the siege of Acre, all means of communication with the besieged fighters were used in order to find out about the difficult situation and to send the money they needed. Contact was made with them by using carrier pigeons and swimmers. Perhaps one of the most famous stories of heroism in the Ayyubid male system is that of a swimmer named Isa. This man was able to enter Acre despite the naval blockade, bringing instructions from the Sultan in a letter which he tied around his middle, along with some money. Once he arrived in Acre, they would release a bird to inform the Sultan of his safe arrival. One night he went down to the sea and tied three bags to his waist, containing 1,000 dinars and letters to the troops. But he could not reach the city, and he drowned off the coast of Acre. They realized something bad had happened which had prevented the release of the bird. A few days later they found his body, with the pieces of gold and the wax seal of the letters around his middle. Ibn Shaddad commented, Never before have we heard of a dead man delivering a message entrusted to his care during his lifetime, except this man. The Yazak Scout Corps Yazak is a Farsi word referring to army scouts. The Yazak were a group of scouts who were sent out in the direction of the enemy ahead of the army. The mission of the Yazak fighters was part of the intelligence system to send information on the approaching army to the army commanders as quickly as possible. So we could say that the word Yazak referred to the system of daily dispatches sent by specialized individuals who were always on standby to go and find out at close hand what the enemy was doing or planning to do. The members of the Yazuk were chosen from among those who were sincere and courageous in war to undertake this duty. They avoided mixing with the enemy whenever possible because the aim of their duties was to estimate the enemy's strength and find out their weak points. Hence they did not wear armor or carry shields or any other heavy equipment that might impede their progress. They chose horses that were calm, swift, of good temperament, sure-footed and strong, and were not easily spooked. In fact, contemporary historians, especially Ibn Shaddad and Alimad al-Isfahani, refer to the Yazak in their narratives and the many missions that they undertook of which sending information was just one. Nothing is more indicative of the importance and critical nature of the Yazak's role at the time of Salah ad Din than the fact that he appointed at its head senior military figures such as his brother Al-Malik Al-Adil and his oldest son Al-Malik Al-Afzal as well as senior Amir such as Badr ad-Din Daldaram al-Jaruqi, Din ibn al-Muqaddim, Izzad-Din Jurdiq, Alam ad-Din Sulaiman ibn Jundur, and others. These emirs all led the Yazak in turn. Among the missions that were entrusted to the Yazak was the task of finding out the situation in cities, especially Jerusalem, when the Crusaders were threatening to reoccupy it after it was liberated in 583 Hijri 
that is 1187 common era. All Salahuddin had to do was send his brother Al-Malik Al-Adil at the head of the Yazak to find out about the city's defensive strength. Al-Adil set out for this purpose in Ramadan 587 Hijri, that is 1191 Common Era. Salahuddin did something similar when he sent the Amir Izzatin Jurdik, Jamal al-Din Farakh, and others to march under the auspices of the Yazak to the vicinity of Jaffa, to find out the numbers of cavalry and infantry in the city. On some occasions, the Yazak carried out ambushes, as happened on the way to Jaffa. This mission was entrusted to Badraddin Daldaram, who set up an ambush involving a good number of troops. Some enemy cavalry came by who were guarding a caravan bringing food supplies. Fighting took place between the two sides, in which the enemy lost. Thirty were killed and a number were taken captive. The Yazak fought the Crusaders on numerous occasions. In one of their clashes, the Yazak almost captured King Richard the Lion-Hearted after he was stabbed, but one of the Crusaders managed to prevent his capture. Richard's compatriot offered himself in ransom for him and distracted the soldier who had stabbed Richard with the fine clothes that he was wearing. So the hapless Yazak focused on this lower-ranking crusader and captured him, and the accursed Richard escaped, leaving no trace. A number of his cavalry were killed or captured, and they fled from that encounter defeated and with their hearts filled with terror. Moreover, the Yazak protected the Ayyubid army against the possibility of sudden attack by the crusaders, as happened at Antioch. These multifaceted responsibilities that were delegated to the Yazak are indicative of their high status in the Ayyubid army, which means that this military detachment included the elite and bravest of the Ayyubid army. The size of the Yazak depended on the military mission being undertaken. Hence, as is to be expected, they included a large number of horsemen. Their number was as great as 1,000 on occasion, as in the case of the Yazak which Salah had been appointed to keep watch on Acre, when he decided to move his forces to Jabal al Kharuba. Thus we see that the Yazak developed as its missions developed through the course of the ongoing bloody confrontations with the occupiers. It developed from a group which specialized in gathering information about the enemy, into an active military organization, which had certain aims of defending Ayyubid army bases or Muslim cities, or launching sudden attacks on enemy camps and setting up ambushes. Pigeon Post One of the main means of communication during the Ayyubid era involved the use of carrier pigeons which are also known as homing pigeons because of their remarkable ability to find their way back to their nests over vast distances. Al-Qadi al-Fadil described this bird in a delightful manner, calling it the angel of kings because it descends from the sky to the kings as the angels descended from heaven to the prophets, alayhi salam ajma'in. It never fell short with regard to what was entrusted to it and no act of betrayal on its part can ever be imagined. In addition to its ability to find its nest, this kind of pigeon was also famed for its swift flight. Even if it was caught and kept away from its homeland for ten years or more, it still possessed strong mental ability, a good memory, and love for its homeland, and as soon as it had the opportunity, it would fly home. Hence the price of these pigeons was very high, as much as 700 dinars and even sometimes 1,000 dinars. The price of a single egg of this splendid type of bird could be as much as 20 dinars. There were organized stations for these carrier pigeons, which were the pigeon lofts for which keepers or guards were appointed to look after them, train them, feed them, ensure their comfort, release them and receive them. 
But when a pigeon landed with a message, the guard did not usually retrieve the message himself. Rather, he would take the bird to the caliph or sultan, lest there be some secret content in the letter which should not be seen by anyone else. Even if the time was not suitable, such as if the sultan was eating or sleeping. So he would leave his food or be woken from his sleep, so that there would be no delay in dealing with urgent and important matters. He would open the message himself, or the head guard would do this task. Nuruddin used carrier pigeons from the time he became governor of Aleppo and Syria, following the example of his father Imad ad Din Zangi. But in 567 Hijri, he organized the pigeon system on a new basis, paying more attention to how pigeons were taken care of and where they landed in various regions of his state. This system was inherited by the Ayyubid state. The appointment of guards and protocols as to how messages were written and attached to the bird, how the pigeons were received, how the messages were opened and read, all of these matters were already in place when Salah ad -Din gained power. All he did was to increase the number of connections between Egypt and Syria by means of this air mail until there was a network of pigeon stations in Egypt and Syria that stretched from the southernmost part of Egypt, from Aswan to Cairo, then Suez and on to Bilbis, then from Bilbis to Syria, and from Bilbis also to Salihiyah and to Katia. From Katia it extended to al Warida on the way to Gaza, then to Gaza. In other words, Bilbis, which lies east of Cairo, was the center for pigeons landing in Egypt. Similarly, from Gaza on the coast of southern Palestine, a line extended to Hebron and to Lud, and from there to Kanun, and then to Jenin, Safad, Baisan, Irbid, Tafas, and then to Damin and Damascus, and from each of these centers to neighboring cities. From Baisan to Atrat, from Damascus, pigeons flew to Baalbek and also to Qara, and from Qara to Homs, and thence to Hama, then al marah then Aleppo, then Bira, and so on for the other cities of Syria and Mesopotamia. These stations undoubtedly contained a large number of pigeons. Later on, it was estimated that the number of birds in the pigeon loft of Cairo alone was approximately 2,000. The profession of raising pigeons became very profitable as there was a high demand for the birds, especially during the Crusader siege of Acre. Alimad al Katib al Isfahani wrote, we began to heap a great deal of praise upon the one who raised these birds, buttering him up with special words of appreciation, asking him to give us more birds, night and day, until his stock ran low because we had asked him for so many. The Ayyubi Dami made use of the pigeon system established by Nuruddin. Salahuddin and his deputies used it at times of hardship. Carrier pigeons conveyed the good news from Palestine to Egypt that the Sultan was safe following the Battle of Ramlah in which the Ayyubid army was defeated. Ali Mahd said, We sent the good news with pigeons. We sent letters with the words to put an end to all rumors and to spread reassurance after fear-mongering had broken out. The Ayyubid army would carry with it pigeons belonging to various regions with which it intended to make contact, or when there was a need to seek help from them, as happened in 574 Hijri, that is 1178 Common Era, when the Crusaders gathered and marched towards Damascus with their king, raiding and plundering the outskirts, killing and taking captives. Salah ad -Din sent word to his brother Riz ad -Din telling him to take a group of soldiers with him, and when he drew near to the crusaders, to inform him of that on the wing of a bird, in other words, by carrier pigeon. So Farah Shah marched with his troops to seek them out. 
perhaps as a confirmation of how well organized the airmail system was during this period. The pigeons continued to reach Salahuddin from all over during his lengthy siege of Acre. Ibn Shaddad states that during Ramadan 586 Hijri, that is 1190 Common Era, pigeons were sent from Aleppo to Hamah and from Hamah to Acre, carrying news from the deputies of Al Malik al Tahir, the ruler of Aleppo, that enemy forces from the Crusader Principality of Antioch were launching raids on villages belonging to Aleppo, taking advantage of the weakness of its forces, which was due to the fact that its troops had gone, led by Al Malik al Tahir, to Acre. But the remaining forces in Aleppo had managed to lay ambushes and defeat the aggressors, who were completely unaware until the swords were falling on them. Seventy-five of their troops were killed and many were taken captive. The Muslims used all sorts of methods to conceal their secrets, so that the enemy would not find out about them, especially during the siege of Acre. They even used special symbols, or what we would call a code, to indicate things that had been previously agreed upon. al imad stated that the male officials carried letters and birds, and they would go back with letters and birds. They would write to us and we would write to them on the wings of birds with a secret code. In these letters were written our secrets. Ambushes There was more ambush activity during the Crusades, especially at the time of Salah ad din than at any other period in Islamic history. This was because of the close proximity of the enemy and the ongoing friction between the Muslim forces and the Crusader strongholds that they established along the Syrian coast or close to it. The word ambush refers to the sending of small parties or expeditionary forces of fighters on horseback towards the enemy to take them by surprise and inflict casualties in limited clashes that do not lead to the level of all-out fighting. These operations were begun in secret, and so the men who fought in them had to have certain characteristics which would enable them to fulfill their mission in the required manner. It seems that after 585 Hijri, that is 1189 Common Era, Salah ad -Din decided that it was better to follow a policy of sending out ambush parties to harass the enemy forces and not leave them any room to relax. In the meantime, he was gathering his forces around Acre. So the Ayyubid army now had to defend Acre on the one hand, whilst laying siege to the Crusaders, who were besieging Acre on the other, and also sent ambushes to harass groups of Crusaders here and there. We find that the circumstances in which the Ayyubid army found itself during this period, and the suitability of the greater Syrian landscape, especially Palestine, with its foliage and mountains in which fighters could conceal themselves, made it essential for the army to organize these types of military actions, which were of limited effectiveness, but were aimed at disturbing the enemy and not letting them feel secure. This method of fighting is akin to that of guerrillas or special forces. End of part two of chapter six.